Hello, uh, hello, 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 uh, hello, and welcome to the Only Fools Love Horses YouTube channel. The Cheltenham Festival is only days away, and I know that me and you watching cannot wait until the Supreme Novices hurdle goes off and we hear that big cheer ring around Presby Park. In preparation for the Cheltenham Festival, we've got two things uh, lined up. We've got our Cheltenham preview on Sunday, star-studded panel of Andrew Blair White, Josh Stacey, Frankie Foster, and no other than Lydia Hislop from Racing TV. They're all coming onto the Twitter Live. We're going to go through all 28 races, uh, previewing all of them, saying our selections, and finally getting our naps for the whole festival. Make sure you tune in 7pm on Twitter, Twitter Live. Get on board. But today, we have a little special video, as you saw there. Uh, if you pause the video or you know have good eyesight, you saw we were joined by some very special guests uh, throughout the last couple of months now. So of interviewing them, uh, just getting their opinions on this year's Cheltenham Festival and previous memories of it. Uh, so before we go into that, uh, firstly, uh, how's the tie, Harry? You look, you look, you look immaculate, Harry. You look immaculate. Thank you. Man. I'm, I'm even uh, obviously a couple of weeks to the festival. I've even got the Cheltenham Gold Cup winners tie, so I oh. thought I'd share with you all. Perfect, so. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. A little friend. French kiss. Perfect, Ross. <laughs> Indeed, Harry. Beautiful tie. And I'm sure he'll be wearing that on Gold Cup Day as Galvin wins. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, so first one, I'm going to throw this to everyone. Uh, how did you get into horse racing? Well, I mean, unlike, I had no interest in the sport whatsoever uh, until I was about uh, 18. I mean, I'd had a bet on the, you know, I remember my granddad unfolding the paper and saying, pick out a national winner, which I did. I had 50p on party politics uh, mm -hmm. and then didn't have a bet for 10 years after that. <laughs> um, but I, at university, I got a job uh, working in the William Hill call centre. And I, I didn't, I didn't, I had no interest in horse racing, but to take, obviously to take bets in a call centre, you need to know everything you if someone rings up and goes i'll have a 10p round robin on the first five at kempton you can't be like oh, i'm sorry i don't know what you're talking about um so we had like a two or three week training session to learn everything about racing and betting and all that kind of thing so that whenever anyone rings up you knew exactly what they were asking uh and then basically while i was at uni i worked part-time in the call center so i got paid to just sit and watch sport and take calls and i was like and just the racing was just i was absolutely fascinated by it um and I think that's the thing with horse racing. A lot of people say we need to make horse racing more exciting and all that kind of thing. But um, for me, the excitement came from understanding it, with someone explaining to me, this is how it works, this is how handicaps work, this is how, you know, group races and, and, and how, you, how you place bets on it and all the different tracks and the different kind of, the different kind of ways you can enjoy the sport. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it wasn't until I was 18, really, that I, got, I actually got into it. I had no interest before that because I didn't, no one in my family really watched it and... I had no really interest in it. And my um, great uncle uh, was a professional, quite a quite a uh, quite a well known professional gambler, apparently, because uh, people have messaged me saying, "Oh, he used to be on the track all the time. We used to know him." Um, but my my family never spoke about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose he, my my two older brothers, David, went off. You know, they were David sort of ten years older than me, and brother Brian is six years old. They went off and worked in racing from a young age. And I just sort of followed them. I got three siblings who, who don't have anything to do with um with, with racing or horses um so yeah so definitely you know watching watching racing and uh, and that side of it definitely um with him would have been would have been what, what got me okay so uh, I, I was very hyperactive as a child and my dad and grandma used to kind of bounce me on their knee and the only way they could sort of shut me up was to read the daily telegraph racing pages and say the names of the horses and make funny names and then obviously no internet in those days so I then wait for the next day's results and hopefully some of the horses we picked out had won. So it kind of really started from that. I've always loved horse racing and kind of earliest memories, you know, be like the 1970, early 1970s with Mill Reef and Brigadier Gerard and Gay Trip won the very first national that I watched, which is quite strange moving forward another 40 or 50 years. Must have known something at the time. I was eight when he won. Uh, so my kind of earliest memories are, are, are around um, really going to a place like Y race course which is long closed and going to Ascot as a kid and, and watching uh, the King George I've got pictures of me in little, like shorts and little check well we come from a horsey family and uh, I first went to Cheltenham in the late 60s uh, my uh, we just were brought up around horses and racing my father uh, 
rode, my mother rode, uh, and just generally horses were our life. And our sporting passion as, as young people was racing. And my first racing memory was sitting around the television watching Red Alligator uh, winning the Grand National and having, and I managed to have a pound with my father on Red Alligator back in 1968. I think I remember uh, Foyne Avon's Grand National. My first television memory was, um, and I remember being driven somewhere with my father saying, we've got to watch the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And it was Millhouse and Arkle. And it, and it was black and white. And my first two television memories were Churchill's funeral and Arkle and Millhouse. So like most people in horse racing, Ross Brearley has had his fair share of bets on the ponies. But he showed us his experiences of working on the other side of the betting desk, as well as working with Paul Keeley and Tom Siegel on the In The No Show on the Racing Post website. I mean, I, it was it was honestly, it was so much fun working there because it was such a bizarre mix of people. Um, there was obviously students who were in there and then there was people who was their full-time job, but people who loved racing were in there all the time. Uh, and I just, from it was just the people you used to call up. You just used to get all sorts of characters. Um, there was a, and obviously they'd come up on the screen uh, and... There was, I think there was like a, there was Wing Commanders. Uh, I think remember Wing, was it Wing Commander Barrington Beadsworth, I think his name was. He used to ring up and place bets. There was a guy who used to ring up and place bets. He used to have 10p. He said, I'll have 10p on all of these, please. Uh, and he'd name like five, six, seven horses in the race. And he, they'd come through and he'd go, oh, I backed a few winners. And you'd think, you, you broke even because you backed half the horses in the race. Um but it was just that it was that it was an atmosphere it was a feeling it was it was people ringing up it was people you were working with um i don't think there's necessarily a standout memory although i remember if harry harry's going to doncaster my first meeting i ever went to was i went to doncaster with some people from the call center on it might have been a tuesday or a wednesday it was completely dead it was horrible weather uh and i don't know if you remember a horse called billy vodden uh, for Henry Daly and the uh, the Trevor Hemming silks, who won some lovely handicap chases, he won a, a novice hurdle there, and he's he's the horse that, that stands out that day. I remember seeing Billy Bodden first time out, and um, yeah, so Donny Races has a, a soft spot in my uh, in my heart. Oh, it's, it's Siegel. It's Tom Siegel. Siegel You've got to get it right. Yes. Uh, yeah, he will. He will. He's, he, will, he, will, he will. He's not happy about that if you get that wrong. <laughs> so that 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 was an early lesson. Yeah, that's a journalism lesson as well, isn't it? Always get. I mean, you did it before yeah, we came great. on, Ashley. Mm. Perfect, brilliant training there. Always get the name right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, what's it like? It's, it's amazing. I mean, I genuinely feel like um, I feel like Paul is like a surrogate uncle or dad to me. Uh, it's so <laughs> nice working with. Him. He's such a lovely bloke. Yeah, uh, and. He, he he absolutely loves the game. He, he has his own way of doing things. He doesn't care how anyone else does it. And he's wonderful to work with. You can throw anything at him and he'll just grumble away and give you give you angles and tips and thoughts. And he's he's really encouraging. He's just he's just he's just a he's a big softy, is, is Keels, basically. Uh and Tom, again, I think Tom has a, a he has a, a a facade of on the outside it. Of, of a bit of a bit grumpy, a bit like oh, I'm not I'm not bothered about this. But again, he loves it. He absolutely loves it. He just loves sport. He's constantly watching sport, and it's amazing to work with two people who are so passionate about the thing you're doing. Because sometimes, maybe not so much in racing, because you only get into it if you're really into it. But sometimes in life, you have a job and you're working with people, and you think you don't want to be here. You're not bothered. Um, yeah. And when you work with people who are into something as much as you do and are so knowledgeable and experienced as well, they've been there, they've seen that, seen it, they've done it. We could not have these absolute legends on the video and not ask them about what their favourite Cheltenham memory. Mine, personally, Bouvedere's first champion hurdle in 2017. That was the first festival I went to and I stood outside the parade ring. My dad asked me, what's going to win the champion hurdle? And I knew, you know, next to nothing pretty much in horse racing. And I just said, Bouvedere. And seeing Noel Feely on the snaff turning the bend and letting Bouvu go and win the champion hurdle, that's personally my favourite memory. So we had to ask uh, the gents who are on, what was their favourite Cheltenham Festival memory? Well, I, I worked for William Hills when I left school uh, and I worked as a board boy, which I don't even know if you guys will know what that is, like writing up the results in felt tip pens. Uh, <laughs> and that, that was how it was. Uh, and then I 
because I was kind of outgoing and social and stuff, I got invited to work in the credit section on the race course and taking clients' bets and also to help laying off money down the rails, which used to be literally hundreds of pounds in my pocket going down, shortening up prices, no internet then. Um, so, uh, but I worked on the race courses 1980, 81, 82, and I haven't been back to Cheltenham since then. So the last, the last time I went, Ruby Walsh's dad, Road Daring Run, Ted Walsh Road Daring Run came third in the champion hurdles. So that's how long ago it is since wow. I've been. Best atmosphere I think I've ever seen here was Sprint Asakura. Um, obviously, when he when he regained the, the Queen Mother, I mean, nobody expected it. He's always been a crowd favourite, but like I say, I walk into the to the winners' enclosure behind every winner, and it literally, it, if there'd have been a roof on the parade ring, it would have come up. And that isn't a joke. It was, like, unreal. Well, I have to say that the best memory is not very difficult to remember, really, because obviously winning a uh, champion hurdle with Alderbrook was obviously going to be my first win at the festival and obviously a best memory. So uh, um, it was a... It was a uh, it, it'll be a moment I don't forget because, actually, if I go back to that time, that my old man was uh, a person who was never one for being um, uh, very productive on the, on the emotional front, and he came up and... Uh, shook me by the hand and said, you know, why is it taking so long? And then and 30 seconds later, he kissed me. The last time we did that was before I was about seven years old. So it gave me quite a shock, really. So that was a memory I won't remember. Well, I won't forget for a while. And obviously you won the Gold Cup in the same week with Master Oates. Was that sort of compared on the same level as the champion hurdle? Well, I think you remember the first time of everything you do in life. And remembering your first one at the festival is probably the moment you remember most. I, I suppose um, my happiest memories would be... Uh, my first memory is a horse called Boring Prince win for Andrew McNamara, who my, my two of my brothers, David and Brian, were for. And then uh, I suppose probably, honestly, my happiest memory of Cheltenham, my early memory of Cheltenham is, is, is taking my dad to Cheltenham for the very first time, who just loved racing. Um, you know, he was a bus driver, always had a bet on a Saturday. It was always the hard luck story because he'd back five horses and four of them would win and the one, the favourite would let him down for a massive payout. So I've, I grew up here in that. So, and to take him to Cheltenham and um, the first time, and I remember we were stood on the lawn waiting for the roar. And I remember I was watching down the start, the two mile start, and, and uh, the tapes went off and the roar went up. And I looked at him, and he was honestly, he, he was just looking up at the stands. And he just he said, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> and uh, I just think that, yeah, so he was, he was like, a, he was like a, to- a kid in a, in a sweet shop, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think yeah, that's one of my, my happiest memories of Cheltenham. Now I love talking to trainers about their potential runners at any track, let alone the Cheltenham Festival. And unfortunately, we weren't able to grab Tom Lacey, who obviously trains Glory and Fortune, and ask him just why Glory and Fortune is going to win the champion hurdle. Wait, right? Right, guys? But as you saw at the start of the video, we did grab two trainers in preparation for this. So we're calling this the trainer section, where we talk about their horses going into the Cheltenham Festival and any fancies they have from their own yard. Strength-wise, how does it compare to previous years um, heading into it? Poor. <laughs> really? Um, well, you know, a lot of years we've gone there with the likes of, you know, um, uh, Capsule was second in the mayor's race, and uh, Colin's sister was fourth in the stairs. Barney Dwan went there, you know, with good chances twice over fences and over hurdles. Um, you know, things like Cool Anley was fourth or fifth in the boys' race. Um, uh, yeah, so the early years probably had a little bit more strength and depth that we went there for, uh, that we went there with. Um, but yeah, so so this year, you know, realistically, or you know, I don't think we'll have many in the handicaps because apart from the two that we just mentioned. But the likes of the the boys race and the and the um, the Coral Cup and things like that just we just the horses won't get in. You know, Timberman, I was hoping to get there, he won't get there. And Art Approval is on by my landlord, he won't probably won't get there. Um, but look, the two we've got, the likes of uh, Alaphilly and um, uh, and Imperial Alcas are, you know, got good chances, and you know, and that's what you want really is those, you know, if those two go and run their races, it'll be a good festival for us. Yeah. I was going to ask him as well about uh, does he know? Um, is he going to go to the Ultima? Or? Well, he'll be he'll be declared for both races because the simple fact of it, you know, that you you don't know until you declare what's likely to run. So. Uh, we yeah. should look clear at the time, but I mean, the, the plan it really is and truly to go to the handicap. But having said that, 
it could change at the last minute, but I don't want it to. So I'm really quite keen that David Bass remains on top. Yeah. I was what just going to say, say still. Sorry. Sorry, uh, Ashley, I was just going to say, did it take much out of him that Ascot run the last day or? Well, the last one was a, it was a good run. It, you know, he was a, he had every right to win it. He was the top rated horse in the race. Um, and, the, you know, a lot of people said to me, well, why did I run him there? Because at the end of it, sure, he's better off trying to win a race in, at Ascot, but sorry, at Cheltenham. But I mean, a handicap for him is a different ball game to what he's been running in. You know, these novices have been running around with four or five other horses. They haven't, you know, they have never had an experience of a, a 20 runner handicap where it's a completely different ball game. So, Saving him for one day to me wasn't an answer. You know, that was a good race to go and win at Ascot. It was worth taking a chance on. Fine, he's gone up five pounds in the handicap. If he's good enough, then five pounds won't stop him. But it's more a question that he might struggle with the, with the conditions of the race because they'll, they'll take him on from day one. It'll be more competitive than he's ever been before in his life. So he just might not be able to handle it. And uh, just, yeah, just, just quickly, obviously, one by 14 lengths quite comfortably uh, there at Ascot. What, and, Few people came out saying maybe the handicapper was quite lenient with his mark, only getting five pounds. What do you make of it personally yourself? I think he's about fair, really. I mean, you, you know, you've got you've got to remember that probably the other horses didn't uh, run up to their true mark, so um, you know it was pretty dark conditions. A lot of us got very tired on the day. Um, we handled the conditions which we thought we would do. Um, I, you know, people people will argue with the handicapper one way or the other. Um, if we go and win by 10 lengths, then they will say, well, the handicapper was too lenient. If we get beat by three, they will say, I'm an idiot for running him. And he's, the handicap has been too tough on him. So He's already um, run, well, won around Cheltenham this season, being under supervision. Obviously, under supervision, uh, went into the rails, coming up the home turn. You were the first off the bridle. Just what do you make of that run in general? Do you think he coped with Cheltenham well? Well, I think the biggest problem we have with him is his his performance before the race because uh, he gets very wound up in the paddock. Um, we last time we ran him there, we took him in, we sat, we, we we mounted him in the pre parade ring and rode him straight through into the paddock and out. The time before he demolished all the rails going into the course and was very difficult to handle. Um, he nearly killed me at, at Newbury 18 months ago. Um, he's he's quite an oddball in that respect. So that's one of my biggest worries about Cheltenham is, is actually getting him onto the course. And once he's on the course, he's fine. But he gets very, um, um, he probably gets very wound up by the whole atmosphere of the whole situation. Um, almost like a horse with claustrophobia, really. So um, we'll have to see how he does. But we lead him down. Uh, Matt, my assistant, is in charge with that one. Um, he's a big, strong lad, so he can keep control of him. Where can we see Imperial Alcazar line up? Will it be the Ultima or the Plate? The Plate. The Plate. I think that's the, 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 the... Yeah, I think I've got to speak to the owners. Mm. Uh, I've seen them on Thursday. And uh, so we, we think the Plate will be where we're going. So, yeah, look, we've got poetic music in the, in, the, in, the, in the bumper. She gets a huge allowance. She gets a four-year-old and a mayor's allowance. So I think she carries tennis stone four or something like that. Um, but you know she needs to run way past her A game, and others need to bring their C game. So, but that's that can happen at Cheltenham. So, she's got form around there. So I'm looking forward to running her as well. And Gumball, looking forward to running him in the uh, in the Grand Annual. So, um, yeah. So that they'll be our main ones anyway. That poetic music for the bumper. Obviously, uh, she won at Cheltenham on New Year's Day, and um, uh, came well off the pace to sort of take up. I thought with plenty in hand going over the line. Were you? Um, Quite impressed with that performance. Yeah, I was because she was a long way back, and and the second horse wasn't stopping. You know, mm. uh, Chester Williams. You know, he gave his one a lovely ride and said all the right fractions. And you know, she just coming down the hill. She was got a bit blocked, so she had to come inside. And, and then yeah, so once she got to the bottom of the hill, she really picked up. And I think Cheltenham form is probably important as well. You know, she likes the track, and she she knows she she knows where she's going. So yeah, no, looking forward to her running. She's you know she's excited. Um, Silver Hallmark, will we see him at the festival? Um, it, it'd need to stay raining. It would need to stay. He would need to. He would need, need to be on the on the soft soft side of, of that of what it is now. So we'll just have to wait and see about him. And uh, Ala Philippe, he was nine to two favourite for the Thames at one point. He just drifted to um, eight to one. How are you? How impressed were you, or how happy were you with his uh, Warwick qualification run? Did he finish fourth or fifth? I want to say. Yeah, it's fifth. Uh, yeah, no, we were happy. He'd been off for a long time. And um, Paddy said he felt great uh, all the way around, turned in the straight, went to go and win his race, went up sides, jumped the second last, a little bit sticky, and then sort of just took a big blow, uh, uh, jumped the last okay, and then, you know, the winners are already gone. So um, so that was that, yeah. So, you know, we were very pleased with him. I think the handicapper dropped him two for that, so that was good. Um, 
so yeah, so no, we we were delighted with that. So, and we've done plenty of work with him since. So there there won't be any excuses on the day. Mm. And um, you mentioned Gumball there for the Grand Annual. Had a nice ding dong battle at Lin- uh, Ludlow uh, December. I want to say, uh, have you yeah. had this race in mind for him? Obviously, he hasn't been seen since then. Yeah, we have because he hasn't been seen since because he's either not been quite right himself or just the ground hasn't been right for him. And he, he he's you know he's an older horse now, and he he just got to pick and choose where you go with him a little bit. Yeah, it was a shame for him at Ludlow. I thought he was going to get his head in front and uh, he didn't quite manage it because he was disappointed at Newbury the time before after running very well at, at Carlisle for us. But um, look, I think something like a grand annual will suit him. Um, he was a bit sticky jumping off at Ludlow uh, and at Newbury, so we've got to be careful of that. Mm. And, uh, but if he, you know, if he jumps off with him and, and they, they go a good pace, he doesn't necessarily have to make the running, but he'll be, uh, you know, Paddy knows his way around there. Um, so yeah, so fingers crossed. Fair Frontiers, Coral Cup, is he still Yeah, going to Fair go? Frontiers will probably run in the boys' race, the Martin Pipe. Um, okay. He's at Reeves rated 137, so he's, you know, it's an order 145. Um, probably more convenient for him to run in that sort of race than um, the Coral Cup, where he probably won't get in. Um, we'll obviously look at the Coral Cup to see how it's um, panning out before we make a declaration. If we can get him a ballot it out, get the money back, well, that's fine. But uh, I don't think he's probably good enough to get in there on that weight anyway. So... Uh, the boys' race is where he'll end up, probably. Have you thought about uh, dropping that race? Yeah. Uh, well, we got a, we got a, we got a, we got a thought or two as who might ride him. Yes. <laughs> Can you give us a hint? No, uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> He's English, anyway. <laughs> there you go. Superb. Just looking at your uh, whole team, this could be the same answer. Or it could be different answers. So, which one would you say going into it is your best chance on paper, and which one is potentially maybe? going a little bit under the radar or uh, maybe a lot of people haven't given him a second look heading into the Cheltenham Festival? Well, we're not such a great big team. We're not a, a massive team. Yeah, it, look, I think Ala Philippe was probably our best chance. Uh, and, you know, I think maybe Poetic Music, you know, with our huge allowance, I think people might just underestimate her a little bit. Yes or no, will Honeysuckle be this year's champion hurdle winner? Does Honeysuckle win the champion hurdle, yes or no? Uh, yes or no, and a reason why or why not, does Honeysuckle win the champion hurdle this year? Just a yes or no for me. Does Honeysuckle win the champion hurdle? Oh, Honeysuckle, does she win, yes or no? Does Honeysuckle win the champion hurdle? Yes, I think Harry has got himself a new catchphrase. Does Honeysuckle win? It's probably going to be his tattoo when Honeysuckle does win. And if you're, if you're listening to Lee, she's going to win by half of the track. But we asked our expert panel, does the star mayor of Henry de Bromhead actually win the champion hurdle? And this is what they had to say. Yes. Reasoning? It's obvious. She's just the best horse. Yeah, she's just <laughs> the best horse. In, she's the best horse in, her, in, the, in the race. And she's getting a ridiculous £7 allowance. So, um, you know, she she could win it off level weights. She's she's so good. And I think, the, you know, and obviously, you know, Henry de Bromhead has done a great job with her. And the, 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 the other key thing to her is Rachel Blackmore. You know, they mm. just... You know, they're just phenomenal together. So, um, yeah, th- that would be definitely the one I'll be cheering for. I do. I think she's a very, very good horse. I would love her to win. Um, a, lot, a lot of people are moaning and groaning about the, the, the allowance that Mayors gets. Um, she's unbeaten. I would love to see her remain unbeaten. I think racing wants to see her win as well. So, um, I don't believe there's an awful lot in that race that can beat her. Yes, absolutely. Um, because she is, I think she's peaking. I think she's going to peak this year. I think she's only eight years old. She's not, you know, she's not an exposed hurdler. She's only been racing, uh, you know, against the boys for a a couple of seasons, really. Um, She's got stamina. She's got speed. It doesn't matter what ground it is. It doesn't matter which way you go. Um, And she's got a jockey on her back who clearly just clicks and she does whatever she asks is asked the, uh, of her from Rachel Blackmore. So interesting because um, I think there's some really interesting novices and juveniles potentially around this season who could step up. But I mean, I'm looking. I mean, I can't. You, you know, you've got a you've got a, a horse coming off an entire season's absence and appreciate it. You've got. The horses she's been beating most of the season. I think she'll win and Zana here will finish second again and it'll just be a repeat of those form lines. And people say it's boring, but kind of dominance and greatness is a bit boring because <laughs> the same thing just happens again. Yeah, and she is, yeah, yeah, she is amazing. Yes. 
There, there we go. go. There, there we go. go. We've heard Seems it. Like you're We've getting, heard you're it. getting a tattoo, aren't you, Harry? If uh, if Honeysuckle wins, um, where is the I tattoo going to be? It. I Harry? agree to it. Um, to be fairly, I think um, I'm still yet to decide where the tattoo will end up being <laughs> if she does win. Um, across the chest, across the chest. I think, I think I'm probably going a horse across the chest and then honeysuckle the best on the top of the back, I think. Yeah, and then so when you're like 45 or something, you'll be thinking, oh, why did I get that tongue? Obviously, she's getting, she's getting the weight allowance. I don't know why, but... I've got a nagging feet. I just there's something in my head that thinks. Mm. I mean, the way appreciated won the supreme. I mean, the, there's no, there was nothing in behind it that's done much since. But you know what Willie Mullins is like. Appreciate it hasn't run for so long, but he's that's the sort of horse that he would win with that would come up and 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 win. I'd love to see Honeysuckle win if I'm being honest. Um, but uh, there's something telling me that appreciate it is underestimated he does because what i want is wait till blackmore to have a moment in the sunshine with a full-on mm. crowd and yeah. honeysuckle yeah. given the reaction we saw at leopardstown mm. then yes but i i see people are saying it's is it a straightforward no it's not and actually quite interesting i was at the grand national weights lunch the other day and a lot of people talking about the mayor's allowance well that's there for a reason there aren't that many yeah. Mm. I don't think there are that many top hurdlers, but my goodness me, it's hard to win back-to-back -back champion hurdles. It is oh, yeah. hard. Now, Honeysuckle's been sweeping all before her, um, but it's none of this stuff is straightforward. History tells you it's not easy. Back-to-back -back Gold Cup winners do not happen very often. That's why Best Mate was just the most brilliant training performance from Henrietta Knight. Now, you might say it wasn't necessarily a golden era of chases, but she produced that horse year on year to win three times in a row. That yeah. is extraordinary. Unbelievable. So, unbelievable, because that was a training performance unparalleled. That's why see, when See You Then for Nicky Henderson won back in the 80s, he was a young trainer then. A fragile horse in the best mate mode. Yet every year he produced that horse to absolutely nail it. Now, who's to say that Honeysuckle won't just turn up? But she is. It's by no means guaranteed because back-to-back you know, uh, -back champion hurdle winners, um, you Isterbrack, yes, a freak. Honeysuckle, <laughs> she's clearly special. Yeah. But... Is she a freak? That was she well, is. I didn't. I, well, she may be. She's clearly cut with a very different cloth. But what did she beat the other day in Ireland? Very true. Very true. There wasn't much. It wouldn't be a Cheltenham Festival preview video without a few tips. So we went and asked all of our interviewees their best bets of the festival, whether it be naps at short prices or a big priced horse, which is being slightly overlooked in the market. Interesting. Let's see what they have to say. It's nothing unusual, but I would say my banker for the festival would be Alaho. Um, it, it just think incredible. Um, I mean, I wouldn't quite say a votor, but I mean, he the way he jumped and travelled and just went from the front. If he's anything like the form he's in last year, or he probably wouldn't even need to be up to that form. I mean, I can't see him being beaten. Um, I quite like the look of Imperial Alcazar in the in the plate. Um, obviously, one one here this season. Um, Fergal O'Brien is no Fergal well, and he's he's some trainer. Um, mm. But I think, I mean, he wouldn't be the biggest price in the world, but I think he he'll run quite well. Yeah, no, um, his, his his new setup is amazing, and he's just he's a great yeah. trainer, honestly. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thank and, you very and much. to be honest, oh, honest, any any win is obviously important to everybody here but for the locals as well it's i mean it's it's incredible when they have a when they have a festival i'll or tell you what i'll tell you i'll tell ball. you what i've backed i'll tell you what i've backed and you tell me what the nap should be how's that sound <laughs> there we go there we go <laughs> okay well speaking of honeysuckle i think tell me something girl will win the mayor's novice uh, the mayor's hurdle um the mayor's novice last year was just an incredible race she was like the she was pretty much the only horse of the entire week to rattle home from the back uh everything 
every other one of Rachel Blackmore's winners was on the speed and kicking on the uh, the home bend. Tell me something, girl came from God knows where. Um, and it was a big run at Leopardstown, I thought, behind Heaven Help Us and Royal Kahala. She, again, it was a huge speed bias that day. She was the only one to make up any ground whatsoever. So I think she'll be ideally suited by that race. Uh, and obviously, Cheltenham form, just it's just, you just got to focus on Cheltenham form. The rest of it doesn't matter. Um, so I think she's really interested. I've had a little tickle on uh, Cur Sublime for the uh, the Arkle each way. Yeah. I think that could be a small <laughs> there, there we go. go. Oh, I thought it'd perk Come up. On. I thought it'd perk up. <laughs> there you go. I don't know which one that's just going to vote for that. I think that's. I think. <laughs> I think it's a huge prize. Oh, I think yeah. it's a huge, huge prize. If you see the race it gave to Fernie Hollow, um, and I think Fernie Hollow would have lapped this lot. So yeah. um, if Fernie Hollow is as good as I think Fernie Hollow is, then Cur Sublime is, is is overpriced, and I think. Edward Stone's potentially peaked. I think Blue Lord is, you know, I'm not going to say clumsy, but certainly not the real deal yet, not completely the, the, the full package. And um, I mean, Kirsten Barnes is second in a triumph and is ex incredibly experienced uh, hurdler. And I just, those first two runs over fences, the first one gave Bernie Hollow a surprise. The second one, I think they maybe had Cheltenham in mind with that. Um, and then last time out, I always like to see a horse coming into the, uh, the festival on the back of a win. So Curse of Lime. And then the other one would probably be uh, probably be Jinto for the Ballymore. Um, because I think so, yes. Gerhard and Dysart Dynamo. There we go, Lee. There we go. I'm, 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 everyone's agreeing. Yeah, yeah, I think Dysart Dynamo and Sir Gerhard will probably... I'm Kilcrow. I think Willie Mullins just loves running horses in the Supreme. So I think they'll probably turn up against each other. Even if Sir Gerhard does go for the Ballymore, I still think Jinto could potentially outstay him. Um, and I think that race will cut up. I don't think the Ballymore Bally lot last year, I remember, of course, was, you know, it was, it, 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 you're getting smallish fields. You're not getting, you're not getting 15, 16 runner um, uh, events, especially because there are only two or three really that fit that credential. Of, you've got your, your proper sloggers go to the Albert Bartlett and your species go to the Supreme and those that, mm. that get stuck in the middle. In between, There's not that many yeah, of them. Yeah. So yeah, so there, there you go. There, there's my three for the festival. Um, you pick, you pick which ones you know. Well, I, uh, I've just loaded up Bet three six five to put a thousand pounds each way on course sublime after your comments, there, Ross. So uh, I think don't you know, do that. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> no, that's... Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> of course. Uh, no, I, I, I looked at that course, uh, course sublime uh, form. And obviously, there's the uh, chance to go to the Grand Annual, uh, but I yeah. thought that running behind uh, Fernie Hollow was too strong to ignore. And I have already uh, already backed him for the race. So that would be where I'd uh, side. Well, I am a sort of an each way thief, really. So <laughs> I'm kind way, of always, I'm always looking from the outsiders in. And then when I find one or two I like, then I sort of don't carry on so much. So um, I'm kind of looking at, well, I was looking at Tiapu before he won yesterday. I really like that horse. And I think eight to one, fantastic each way bet. And he can quicken twice in a race. He won't mind if the ground comes a bit good. Nubi Negra each way, same kind of thing. Uh, Diesel Dahlia in the um, cross country. That's when you guys probably will go and have your tea break when that race is on. But I really like that sort of thing. LA Bell in the Mayor's Hurdle again. You know, these are all horses that are going to be like in the first three, probably may not win, but might win if one or two little things go wrong. Uh, and I just want them to get Jack qualified for the Fox Hunters because he's my favourite <laughs> horse. I think Sam's going to ride him next week and hunt him round, hopefully at Donny, and get him in. So if you like each way bets, three under five is the other one I really like. Just they haven't decided which one of the two races to run him in. But you know he's going to jump round. They're going to pay the first four or five in that either race. So he'll sneak in the frame. He's 12 or 14 to one. So there's half a dozen little each way bets for you there. Oh, blimey, you're asking an impossible question without a paper in front of me. <laughs> Is there any horses um, off the top of your head? Dark horse, that's going to be a really difficult question. As I haven't even got any idea what's like it being declared. So um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to ask my uh, Earthwell assistant on the other side of the table who might have some sort of idea. Oh, go for it. Um, Imperial Races or Imperial Alcazar? Uh, we're going to go for Imperial Alcazar. <laughs> a good decision. Fact, thank you very much. Yeah. That's an easy one, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we come from a horsey family, and uh, I first went to Cheltenham in the late '60s. Uh, my, uh, we just were brought up around horses and racing. My father uh, rode. My mother rode. Uh, 
and just generally horses were our life and our sporting passion as, as young people was racing. And my first racing memory was sitting around the television watching Red Alligator uh, winning the Grand National and having, and I managed to have a pound with my father on Red Alligator back in 1968. I think I remember uh, Foyne Avon's Grand National. My first television memory was, um, and I remember being driven somewhere with my father saying, we've got to watch the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And it was Milhouse and Arkle. And it, and it was black and white. And my first two television memories were Churchill's funeral and Arkle and Milhouse. Races like yesterday, it'd be good if you have like, under the Frankel bar, if you're from the LGBT community and you want to meet up for a drink, to come and meet us. You know, it'd be quite easy for race courses on the website to have a little section there to get together meeting points. Even things like gender neutral toilets, you know, not, not loads, just having one or two at each racetrack. Um, not going to cost a lot of money, making sure all the locks on the cubicle doors work. You know, we're not talking big time stuff here. But I would just like to see um, a, a developing kind of confidence and accessibility for people. So you might kind of think, oh, there's not really any issues. So what's kind of going on here? Um, so it's just little subtle things. I mean, I guess in, so if you look in 10 years time, you think if there's no need for this group, that would be the outcome. Well, I'll tell you what, as ever, I mean, you asked for one nap, I gave you three horses. You asked for one thing I could change, I'll give you three. I'll give you crack three on, things I could change. Um, like I said to you earlier, I think the sport should do better at explaining the complexity of it. I think it's an incredibly fascinating and complex sport, but I think it, it expects people to come along, have a few pints and just get it on the first day, which I think is impossible. I think it's one of those things that you fall in love with and you... And, and, and we should be we should encourage people to get into the complexity of it um, rather than just treat it as a any other sport because it's not any other sport. Um, so I think definitely teaching people coming into the sport what it's all about should be better. Uh, I think food on the track. Come on. Oh, honestly, honestly, too expensive. I mean, and there's not much, not much of it. It's awful, isn't it? I mean, you can go. I can go now into into town uh, and, and find a three or four food trucks or something with 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 one bloke making the best falafel and halloumi wrap you've ever had in your life for six quid. <laughs> and I'll go to I'll go to Donny Racers and they'll say, "Would you like Would you like half a fish and some chips for a tenner?" <laughs> it, it's there's so many people out there doing incredible street food. Get them on the track. Mm. Get them on the track, and then I I would go there to eat and watch the races. Uh, and, and while we're at it, let's get some, you know, better drinks as well. There's a food and beer revolution, but you wouldn't know it if you went to a race course, would you? Yeah. Just Guinness. Um, just Guinness. It's just Guinness. <laughs> it's just Guinness, <laughs> which admittedly is a food as well. Um, yeah, true, true. So, uh, okay, so they're the two. What was the third one? Anything sport the related. Anything. Sort of oh yeah, system. and that was, and and it would be the, and again, the national hunt season. I just think I, I love. I love every I love everything building up to Cheltenham, but you, you, if you're a two mile hurdler, you shouldn't have fifty nine options to run in over the winter. Yeah. The Irish are beating the British because when the best come up against the best, they get better, mm. um, and that's not what happens in Britain. You get to go away and win your own fiddly little little race, and then they come together and they go, "Oh, did you win a five hundred? Oh, yeah, I won a five hundred. And then the Irish just <laughs> go past and destroy us so it needs to be made more competitive um which means cutting back the options for the top class horses mm. um if you cut back the options of top class horses increase them in the middle and get the money up so that people want to invest and when they get an even if you've got an average horse you're still getting some bang for your buck um yeah. but it's such a big job because you need to you need to clean the slate completely and start start from scratch which is difficult it's a tough one because obviously we've got loads of tracks in Britain. They want, you know, paying customers to come in. They want racing. So it's hard to, you know, it's going to be hard to see which races won't go where and which races get cut off and, mm. and stuff like that. So it's a very difficult job. I don't envy the people at the BHA trying to sort it out, to be honest, but something does need no, to be it's, done. No, it's, it is an impossible task, isn't it? I, agree. I mean, it, you, it's, a fa it's a fantasy. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah. It's if, you, if you could start the whole thing uh, again, that's yeah. how you would do it. Um, but... Uh, 
Yeah, I, I'm saying, yeah, I think we should do that, but I'm definitely not volunteering to do it. <laughs> I don't think any of us will either. Less is more. I don't think there could be a better point to end on from the legend that is Rupert Bell. But thank you very much for tuning in today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, It's quite a lengthy video, but I thought very fun and enjoyable one to record and hopefully it's fun and enjoyable for you to watch at home. Uh, we'll be back, as I said, Sunday evening live on Twitter. It'll be on the top bar of your screen on Twitter, uh, on either my profile, uh, Harry at HarryBeard7 or Lee's uh, at RacingLee1. Uh, we will be on a live with Lydia Hislop. Uh, Josh Stacey, Andrew Blair White and Frankie Foster, potentially a few more big names as well, getting the contracts finalised. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be great crack. Um, two hours of just pure fun, firing it out before the Cheltenham Festival. What more could you ask for? Um, but yeah, if you haven't already, like, subscribe, comment uh, how how much you enjoyed it really, uh, or any criticism at all, comment it down below. We take it on the chin, don't worry. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for watching. Uh, we will catch you at the Cheltenham Festival. Come on. Thanks, guys. Uh, I mean, Thanks, just, just keep cracking on. Like I said, I know the, the name's great. Build that following up. And I mean, young people who are actually, you know, getting into the, the complexity and the, and the joy of the sport. Um, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, we will definitely watch out for it. Uh, so that's all from us, Lee. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it's, Thank I've, you. I've really enjoyed the uh, time here. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for both Harry and Lee there. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you on. And uh, I can't wait for three under three five to win. Thank you. And don't forget at Racing with Pride on the Facebook and at Twitter. So there are our handles. So I'll get shot if I don't mention that. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Ben. See you in three weeks' time. See you in three yeah. weeks. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yes, Bye. Cheers, Bye. Mate. Thanks very much.